So we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Aaron Campbell here tonight, who is the Wyoming State Geologist and Director of the Wyoming State Geologic Survey. She was appointed to that position in 2017 by Governor Matt Mead. She has a Bachelor in Geology from Occidental College and a PhD from the University of Wyoming, also in geology. Um, I'm uh, pleased to say that she worked as a geologist for Chevron Corporation, which uh, so did I, uh, though she didn't work for them quite as long as, as I did uh, in Louisiana and California before coming back to Wyoming to teach at the University of Wyoming, where she worked for 15 years in the faculty there. She taught undergraduate graduate courses, directed the geology field camp, conducted research in structural geology and geomechanics. Uh, she spent one year as the manager of the Energy and Mineral Resources Division at the Wyoming State Geologic Survey before Matt Mead appointed her as the state geologist and director of the survey. In her current position, uh, she directs the Wyoming State Geologic Survey, serves as a cabinet member for the governor of Wyoming, is a commissioner for the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, and, the, and also the Enhanced Oil Recovery Commission. So she is busy. She's also a board member for the Wyoming Board of Professional Geologists and a member of the Wyoming Consensus Revenue Estimating Group. She's even busier. And in the spare time that she might be able to find, she enjoys raising her two young adults now. They're no longer really children, as well as camping, fishing, quilting, and weaving here in the state of Wyoming. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Aaron Campbell. Okay, I am going to pull my slides up here. So this will take a second. Okay, let's see. I'm not getting, okay, I wanna get rid of this one. We're getting you out. You're, you're online. Just out here. Okay, let me stop the share and I will try again. Oh. Bingo. There we go. Takes a while. <clears throat> Okay, got it. Looks good from here. Great, thank you. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, I am really excited about the chance to tell you about the things we're doing at the Wyoming State Geological Survey. There are a lot of state agencies that got, get a lot of press like the Game and Fish, um, DEQ, but the Geologic Survey does a lot of great work. And since you're the geologist of Jackson Hole, you can probably appreciate that, but um, I am going to tell you just a hint about what we're working on because we do a lot and I tried my best to keep this to an hour. So fingers crossed. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is tell you a little bit about the history of the state geologist and the geologic survey and how it came into being. So in 1877, the territorial governor appointed the um, territorial assayer, which was designed to increase mining activity in the state. So the territorial assayer's job was to collect samples from prospectors around the state and that run the sample analyses for $1 for gold and silver and $3 for other metals, and then keep records of the location and the type of mine. But um, if you have ever encountered a prospector, you know how much they like to tell you where they have their claims. So this didn't go over super well. And also another thing that happened was the governor wasn't paying the bills for the office and the territorial assayer was paying the bills for these analyses himself. And he and the governor had gotten crosswise. So he, he quit. And then the governor appointed the territorial geologist shown in this picture, our first territorial geologist. And now the, um, the addition of, um, they had, he, he was writing reports about the, um, the mining results that he had gotten. And then in 1890, when Wyoming beha became a state, the Wyoming state constitution includes a description of the state geologist and the state geologist's role. But there was 
very strong opposition from some people to have a state geologist. And a Laramie merchant was quoted as saying, my experience is that geologists have been a useless expense. I have yet to have the first geologist tell me anything beyond the expression of an opinion. So it turns out that that guy had invested heavily in a mine in Montana and lost a lot of money. And um, fortunately, the legislature did not listen to him and the state geologist was created. Then in 1901, the um, office of the state geologist was um, started where there were now some staff to go with the position of state geologist. And at that time, the state geologist was also the inspector of mines. And he spent a lot of his time investigating mine fraud and testifying in court cases about mining fraud. And then in 1933, they had um, some budget cuts and they, they um, canceled the office of the state geologist and created the geologic survey, which was part of the University of Wyoming. And a, the previous state geologist who was kicked out at that time argued, the duties of the state geologist's office are primarily of an economic nature dealing almost wholly with practical problems. It would be entirely unfeasible to combine this department with an academic department where theories only are propounded and where practical experience and requirements are not predominant. So not a fan of the academic world there. Um, it, eventually the State Geologic Survey in, in 1969 separated from the university and became an independent state agency and that's where we are today. And so there were a number of statutes that dictate what the Geologic Survey does and they're very similar to what they were in 1933. And so we're essentially tasked with studying the mineral resources, physical features, um, fossils in the state, creating reports and providing those reports and advice to the public. And that is, so we've been doing that since 1933. Um, John already went through a list of the things that I do as state geologist, so I don't need to say this again. It's, um, we wear, I wear a lot of different hats in this position. The, the Craig group, the consensus revenue estimating group, if you're not familiar with that, that is the, the group that forecasts how much money the state is going to have to spend. And as a geologist, I'm bringing in the forecast for oil and gas, coal, and all the mineral resources, which as you may know, is 50 to 70% of the revenue for the state, either directly or indirectly, because of state taxes for people working in the industry. So that is a big job. And there are other um, agencies within the state that contribute numbers to that as well, but that is a role that we take very seriously at the survey. Okay, um, so the programs that we have at the geologic survey, oil and gas program, coal, mineral resources, um, specifically critical minerals is where a lot of our focus is. And most of my talk tonight is going to be probably half is going to be critical minerals. But I'll also touch on geologic hazards, groundwater, geologic mapping, and some of our outreach programs as well. So the projects I'm going to talk about um, in energy and mineral resources, I'm going to talk about critical minerals. We have four projects ongoing that I'll describe to you. Geologic hazards, I'm going to focus on our landslide susceptibility map, which is of great interest to those of you here in Teton County, and our geology of Yellowstone map. And I'll just quickly talk about a couple things in our groundwater program, our state um, groundwater salinity report, and our groundwater atlas. Just a brief touch on geologic mapping and, and communication and outreach. So critical minerals. Um, if you haven't heard of them already, you will. So critical minerals, uh, definition of that is, are any, they're actually elements, but they're metals and non-metals that are vital for our technological society that we have. So batteries, jet engines, uh, cell phones, medical equipment, military equipment, are all, all use these critical minerals. And if, if they are vital to our well-being and the supply chain has, are at risk of be, is at risk of being disrupted, they've been defined as critical minerals. And the focus on this started first with Trump's 2018 executive order on the strategy to ensure the access to critical minerals. 
And then the USGS was tasked with creating a, a list of critical minerals that I'll go over in 2018. And then funding started going to different organizations to support investigation for critical minerals. So the Department of Energy received quite a bit of money for grants, and that money is mostly going to academic departments and industry. The USGS received money through the Earth MRI program, and that goes to the state geologic surveys. And all of us at the state surveys are very grateful that the USGS recognized that the expertise for local things like this are in the states and not as much at the federal level. So we do a lot of great collaborative work with them. And then in 2020, Trump had another executive order addressing the supply chain minerals. And in 2021, there was a scheduled update to the list of critical minerals. And I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. And then Biden had a 2021 executive order on America's supply chains. So this is a bipartisan recognition of this need um, for critical minerals for the stability of our society. And I've been out of touch with I was, I've been camping the last five days and I don't know what's happened with the news, but there are the energy and infrastructure bills. I believe the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed the Senate. Um, that actually has a lot of money, $320 million to go to state geologic surveys across the nation to look for critical minerals. So it'd be great if that came through. We, um, that's over five years. So Wyoming would probably stand to get a million or a million and a half every year to work on critical mineral exploration. So what are the critical minerals? This is the original list that the USGS and the federal government came up with. And this was the 2018 list. And I've highlighted in red the elements, or they call them critical minerals, but the elements that we have a potential for, or we've already recognized in Wyoming. Um, so aluminum, cesium, chromium, cobalt, graphite, helium, manganese, niobium, um, platinum group metals, those are the six precious transition metals that are silvery white and um, unreactive. So platinum, rhodium, palladium, osmium, iridium, and ruthenium. And then the rare earth elements group, that's shown down at the bottom of the screen. And those are essentially the lanthanides that are at the bottom of the periodic table of elements, the metals down there, plus scandium and yttrium. And so they all have very similar characteristics. <clears throat> and then we also have the potential for tantalum, tin, titanium, tungsten, uranium, vanadium, and zirconium. So um, the, the update that the USGS has done, what they did to make this update is, this is a report that you can go out and look at yourself if you are so inclined on the USGS website. So they looked at, um, what minerals are at risk in terms of supply and what minerals could become too expensive um, based on what the source is. And then, so up in the corner, it has the explanation. So the size of the dot is the trade exposure. The color of the dot is the supply risk. The um, x-axis is disruption potential. So that's the possibility that we couldn't get it. The y-axis is economic vulnerability, and that's how, it, how much it would cost. So if you're looking at, um, you wanna see a big, well, we don't wanna see, but for Wyoming, we would, for things we want to explore for, we're looking for a big dot in dark red on the upper right side of that plot. And so, for example, some of the ones that are standing out in the field uh, far, uh, far ways are um, cobalt, gallium, niobium, ruthenium, and neodymium. So um, they updated that list this year, and this hasn't been approved yet, but the recommended update the USGS has done is they've essentially removed a couple things, potash, strontium, rhenium, um, helium, and uranium. Helium they moved out because it's a gas. Uranium, it falls under energy minerals now. But what's exciting for Wyoming is they added nickel and zinc, which are two things that we do have. So that is good news for us. So now, uh, let's see, there we go. So I went, I took the USGS chart and I circled things that we have in Wyoming. So all of the ones that, are, that have a circle around them have a, a potential for, for um, being produced in Wyoming. And so cobalt is that one that stands way out in the field by itself. 
The ones in the middle sort of of the, of the area are um, the platinum group elements and neodymium down at the bottom are the rare earth elements and upper left are more platinum group, group elements and some tungsten. So some of these in that, in that really critical zone are things that we potentially have in Wyoming. So where are we looking for these things? Um, this is a long list of lots of different um, perspective areas. The ones in red are the ones that I'll be talking about tonight. Those are the things that we at the Geologic Survey are working on. But I would also like to point out that the Phosphoria Formation and the coals in the Greater Green River Basin and Powder River Basin are being examined by the School of Energy Resources at, Wy at the University of Wyoming. So they're working on those. We're doing some work in some of these other, um, other areas. And I will take you through some of them, but not all of them tonight. So we're going to start with the Central Laramie Range and the Earth MRI program, that USGS funding that came as a result of um, that Trump's executive order. So it's a partnership between the USGS and the Geologic Surveys. And the, end, the goal is to have really good, strong geologic mapping, geophysical surveys, and um, produce a geospatial database where all of these data can be accessed. So what we are working on specifically in Wyoming are the one we're farthest, the project we've um, gotten farthest along with are critical minerals in the central Laramie range. So if you're not familiar with the Laramie range, Cheyenne is to the east and Laramie is to the west of um, the Laramie range in this picture. And so we are working on some one to 24,000 scale bedrock maps, specifically King Mountain and Ragged Top Mountain. And those are the boxes outlined in red. Um, we've already published a Goat Mountain Quad, which is the box outlined in black. The blue box is the entire outline of the area that we're working. And the dotted black line is the Rock River one to 100,000 um, quad that we just published recently. <laughs> Running LIDAR over all these areas? So there is some LIDAR in existence already. We are not running it ourselves. Um, Wyoming, so the there's a LIDAR program called 3DEP through the USGS, and they show Wyoming as being completely covered in LIDAR. The problem is it's very low resolution in some places, and it's not accessible is a problem. But we're working on it. We're working on it. OK. So um, what are we studying specifically? So the central Laramie range has some really interesting rocks. Um, the Laramie and Northosite complex is, uh, and there's a Laramie and Northosite complex and the Horse Creek, Creek and Northosite complex. And those rocks are um, predominantly plagioclase, pyroxene and olivine. And they are enriched in iron and titanium and vanadium. And titanium and vanadium, I've highlighted in red the critical minerals on here. And then chromium and nickel are also some things that we might find in there. Um, so the, if you're not familiar with the Northosite, that's essentially the rock that's found on the moon. So it's a very unusual rock type. Um, also in here, uh, and they're shown on this slide where it says LAC, and HCAC are the um, Northosite complex. And then up on the higher, the upper part of the map in ERGB, that's the Elmer's Rock Greenstone Belt. And that is also an area that's enriched in, in minerals. And a greenstone belt is a zone of metamorphosed mafic to ultramafic um, volcanic rocks that were former ocean, ocean spreading centers. Um, and then they are accreted to Archean terrains. And so we're, Along the line here, you see the word Cheyenne Belt, and I'll talk more about that later. That's where we had the collision between the um, Wyoming province and Colorado province. And I'll explain that more in the next area that we're studying. But um, anyway, so we're looking at these, um, at these mafic magmatic oxides. We're also looking at what's called conduit type deposits. And that's where you have magma passing through the crust and the mineralization concentrates in these zones of intrusion. And that would be the Kennedy Dykes worm, which is KDS up at the top of that map. 
Um, and then the comatiatic Elmer's rock greenstone belt and comatiate is, um, is very mafic, um, ultra mafic volcanic rock derived from the mantle. So again, very unusual compositions that can be concentrated in, in these elements. In this case, nickel, platinum group, and chromium. Um, there are deposits of graphite that were actually mined in this area in these supercrustal belts that are sedimentary rock deposited on the craton and then metamorphosed. But what we're focusing on is the unidentified mineral system where we're seeing all these minerals, including the rare earth elements or the uh, rare earth elements and the critical minerals, tungsten and nickel. And that's part of the Horse Creek and Northosite complex and the Sherman Batholith, which is SB on this map. So that's where the maps that we're focusing on. We're looking at that because we're not sure why we have that mineralization there. And then additionally, there is uranium and aluminum in a number of these rocks as well. Do you need to sample that? That's how you know it's there? Are yeah, there? let me get to that. Yeah. In fact, I'm super tight for time, so I might hold questions to the end. I, I should have trimmed it down, but I had so much to tell you. I'm just going to go fast. Um, so some of the things that we've looked at here in the central Laramie range, um, so we sampled things like this hydrothermal um, alteration. It's, there, this is a zone of boudinage garnet, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it has tungsten in terms of critical minerals, tungsten and um, and tin and zirconium and, and some other interesting minerals as well. And so we've collected several hundred samples out here and we've almost completed the, the two geologic maps in this area. And a lot of the samples are still being sent out for analysis and we'll publish, um, all of our data are public. So we'll have that on, online for everyone. Another example of what we'd sample is um, this vein cutting a hornblende monza cyanite and so in this case, it's enriched with quite a, quite a lot of different critical minerals, titanium, vanadium, chromium, uh, manganese, nickel, and zirconium, so, um, or zinc. So that's, that one's a pretty interesting um, sample there. And then there was some mining that took place out there. The Iron, Mi Iron Mountain Mine was originally created um, for heavy ballast. And now we're realizing that it has titanium and vanadium in it. And so we're sampling that for um, possible critical minerals there. And that was on the quad that we completed last year, the Goat Mountain Quad. So that is our work in the Central Laramie Range. We have one more year on that project. Uh, we're getting close. We're finishing up the field work and we'll have that report out probably in a year. Um, so the Medicine Bow Mountains is another area that we're looking at. And now is while, where I'll describe the Cheyenne Belt, if you're not familiar with that. But that is, so the Medicine Bow Mountains, we're moving further west from, um, we're west of Laramie now in the Medicine Bow Mountains. And this is a collision zone between the Archean Wyoming province and the Proterozoic uh, Colorado province. And this collision occurred about 1.78 to 1.74 billion years ago. And it created a zone of really highly deformed, highly metamorphosed rocks. And um, right along this suture, there is quite a bit of mineralization that has taken place. Additionally, if you look to the southeast of the Cheyenne Belt, there's a little blue area. That is the Lake Owen complex. And if you go to the west of that, there's the Mullen Creek complex. And those are two layered mafic intrusions, mafic and ultra mafic intrusions. And they have had quite a bit of mineralization associated with them as well. So in the Mullen Creek complex, there's been some significant production and they have documented the platinum group elements, uh, the rare earth elements and uranium. And then you can see the list of elevated elements as well. And there's some byproducts that were not economic at the time, you know, 50, 70 years ago. Now we probably would be producing that nickel and that zinc as well. So that um, is, we're starting that one this summer on the mapping. This is an example of what the Lake Owen mafic, layered mafic rocks look like. And so this picture is a magnetite gabbro and it hosts titanium and the platinum group elements, um, platinum and 
What is PT? What's that? Palladium. Palladium. I think that might be PD. Pallad yeah, platinum is PT and palladium is PD, right. Um, anyway, so the, the rocks they have out here are um, pretty much pyroxene, flage, and olivine is in different combinations and magnetite. And so we get uh, gabbro-norite, troctolite, um, all of these very, very mafic rocks. Um, but Where one, is it on the map? Um, so the, on the southeast corner, see those curved lines, that, mm -hmm. the concentric lines, that's the, that's the layered mafic intr intrusion. Huh. And that's the lake, that's the Lake Owen maf maf mafic intrusion. So what we're really excited about is that um, we were able to interest the USGS in running some aeromag surveys. So they're going to fly magnetics over the Medicine Bow Mountains. Um, that is going to be happening next summer. It's a $500,000 survey. We were able to get $50,000 in match from the state legislature. And the outline of the geophysical survey is in blue. We, the black area is the wilderness area. So we're skipping around the wilderness area. And then the green area highlights the Lake Owen complex. So we're gonna do high resolution over Lake Owen and sort of, you know, still good, still high res resolution over the entire area, but very high resolution over Lake Owen. But what was even more exciting is after we got the bid back from the contractor, our, our final invoice from the contractor, we had 25% of the money left over and we're gonna, we're negotiating for additional aeromag surveys over the Sierra Madres, which are further to the West. So very exciting. And what we're trying to do is trace the, trace along that Cheyenne belt. And um, if, if you're not familiar with aeromag, it helps you see what's in the subsurface. If it's covered by trees and overburden, if there's not outcrop, you can find an outcrop of something with potential. And if it has a magnetic signature, you can trace it in the subsurface with the aeromag. So it's very, very exciting. We are so thrilled to have that um, blown next summer. Um, it's not too long. It's just like a month, maybe. I think. I'm not 100% sure, but they they run they fly a lot of them. So yeah, we just we're waiting for our turn at this point. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on to the heavy mineral sands and paleoplasters. And so if you remember a placer deposit in terms of gold, it's where if you're on a, um, a river and you have uh, the um, inside bank with the gold, the, the, fa the, quick, the fast river carries the heavy minerals and heavy elements. And when the water slows, it drops them out of suspension. And you get a placer deposit of gold on the inside of a, ri of a, river, of a river bend um, at the bottom of a, of a waterfall where two streams come together is where you find placer deposits. So heavy mineral sands are um, sandstones that are, or they can be, they can be fairly um, indurated, but in this case, these are um, solid sandstones from the Rock Springs Formation. Um, but so actually the world's primary source of titanium is heavy beach placers. And so what they're doing is they are mining um, lithified beach placer deposits. And that's where most of the world's titanium comes from. 90% of the world's zirconium comes from heavy mineral sands. So titanium and zirconium, those are really strong sources. Um, also rare earth elements can be found in them as well. And there's the potential for possibly hafnium, niobium, and vanadium. So this picture is the uh, Rock Spring sandstone at the McCourt tongue of the Rock Spring sandstone near uh, Rock Springs on the Rick Richards Gap map, which we published last year. We ran a number of analyses and we did find, um, we did find, we did find, um, have, we did find some critical minerals, but not in great concentrations. But the Rock Springs formation is part of the Mesa Verde group. And so these are not river placer deposits, these are beach placer deposits. And so what happens here is you have um, the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway and the water is coming in from the ocean. When it hits the shore and the waves are going back and forth, it drops out its heavy minerals then. Or just when it turns and um, goes into the longshore current, it'll also drop the heavy minerals there. So you get 
a concentration of these heavy mineral sands right along the shoreline. So um, that's what we are focused. That's one of the things that we focused on. This is just an example from the Mesa Verde um, formation. But there are a number of different ones that I'll talk about in a little bit. The Rock Springs work that we did, which is looking at that Mesa Verde um, longshore current and, and Western Interior Seaway deposit, we published that report. And although we came up with fairly strong geochemical analyses, it's a lot of titanium oxide, the extent of the, of the deposit is not that large and the sandstone is very hard um, as compared to where it's being mined in other places. So it's a potential, it's probably low on the list and we're continuing to look in other areas and sample um, similar deposits in the Rock Springs Formation and uh, see what else we find. But there are a number of possibilities for these paleoplasters. And I have a thin section from the Rock Springs um, heavy mineral sand there. So um, we're looking at actually the quartz pebble conglomerates in the Medicine Bow Mountains. So on the Wyoming Craton, there are some old conglomerates that have potential for heavy mineral sands. The Cambrian flathead sandstone actually has some heavy mineral sands associated with it. And we have a bunch of samples that a colleague who was working in the Bighorns very kindly brought back at least 70 samples for us, which was amazing. Um, we're gonna keep, continue to look at the Mesa Verde group, but what, where most of the world's heavy mineral sands are mined, the mining and the heavy mineral sands are in the less, um, the less lithified deposits, so the younger deposits. So we're gonna also look at the Wind River Formation and the White River Formation in central Wyoming as well. And then the last thing that we're looking at in terms of um, critical minerals are how, how they might be associated with coals. And so there's very little data in Wyoming on the trace elements that are associated with our coals. And so we are collaborating or um, working in, in parallel with the UW SER group, who's working in the Greater Green River Basin and the Powder River Basin. We're focusing in the Kemmerer coal fields and we are sampling um, the coals themselves, the underclays, the overburden, the interbeds to try to see if there are critical minerals in there and where they're concentrated relative to those coals. And that's very, it's in the early days. We have the samples collected we, and we have, we have run, we've run some of them, but um, that report, oh, I give it six months for that report to come out probably. And then I wanted to do a little plug for our mines and minerals map, which is an online resource that you don't have to have GIS to run. You can use it online. Um, we are trying to get every mine, every prospect, every analysis that we can on a platform that's accessible to people. Obviously it's a big job and we haven't finished, but we're releasing what we have and we're letting people know what areas are complete. Um, so you could go in here and you can click on the critical minerals layer pulls up all of the claims anywhere that's been sampled. If you click on that um, claim itself, it'll pull up the analysis if there's geochemical data. So we're hoping to provide a resource for people to further the work in uh, Wyoming on mineral research. Along the lines, so now I'm gonna shift to hazards, um, but along the lines of our online maps, we also have a geologic hazards web map. And so um, we have on that map earthquakes, landslides, quaternary faults, expansive soils, and windblown deposits. So I'm going to talk to you about landslides um, first, and pretty much only off this map. So don't worry, I'm not going to be here all night. Um, so the the landslide susceptibility map that we've created is we what we did was we looked at um, two aspects. We looked at rock strength and um, and slope. So in terms of rock strength, it's broken into one, two, and three. Uh, rock one is crystalline granite. Two would be a sandstone. Three is unconsolidated rock or slippery shales. And then the slope one to eight with eight being steepest. So as you can see, a flat granite has zero landslide potential. A very steep shale has high landslide potential. And so that's gonna be red on the map. And look where we are right now. We're in the red part. Um, 
So high landslide um, susceptibility. This isn't predicting a landslide. It's just talking about su being susceptible to it. Um, and so one thing that we're doing right now is we are, since we've done a statewide version, now we're going to zoom in and do more detailed work in Teton County. So um, we, one of the re a couple of the reasons we're able to do this is we have some new field work that we've done, some LIDAR data that has been flown and is available. The 24,000 scale bedrock mapping is almost complete, so we know what the rock type is. And of course, there's the fact that Jackson needs, needs the work. Um, there are landslide prone areas, there is, there's development going on, and um, it's good to have that, that information available. So on the lower right corner there is an example of how the LIDAR is being used. The red line shows where we used to have pre-existing landslide maps, landslides mapped. And the black line is the new mapping with the LIDAR. You, you can see the, the mm -hmm. um, corrugations, a lot, of, a lot more variation in the surface where the actual landslide took place. So our resolution on existing landslides is much higher with the LIDAR data. Okay, so how we're doing this is we're only focusing on um, deep seated landslides. So we're not looking at rock, rock falls, we're not looking at debris flows or little mudslides, deep seated landslides is what we're looking at. And so on the um, lower left, an example of that, that's a translation, translational landslide where it slides along a bedding plane. That's for example, the Grovant landslide. On the right is a rotational landslide um, which was, for example, is the budge drive landslide. So those are the kind of things that we're going to be doing. We're working in Teton County outside of Yellowstone because that's not, you know, it's federal land in there. We're not going to worry about it. Um, our resolution is about five to 10 meters and we're only looking at susceptibility. So this doesn't take, in, take into account landslide triggers like pre precipitation or seismicity or things like that. Um, and it does not replace the need for a geotechnical survey if someone is, is building. But it, it might be a nice first look at an area that might be more prone is what we're, what we're hoping for. And they may be areas that warrant more monitoring. And so the data that go into that, um, so we have the slope data and we have uh, nice digital elevation models to work from and also improved um, topography from the LIDAR. We have the rock strength, which comes from the rock type, and now we have full coverage with um, bedrock mapping. And then, so we combine those and get the susceptibility, and then we overlay that with existing landslides that we've mapped now that we've improved with the LIDAR. So we're gonna have a lot more detailed um, idea of what the susceptibility is in this county. Okay, and that, um, that actually is a layer, gonna, it, these are layers on our, our online hazard map. So they'll, the Teton County one will be on our online hazard map as well. So we don't do a lot of work in Yellowstone, but Yellowstone is obviously a <laughs> geologic hazard. We collaborate with, um, with the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. And when I started going to those meetings, I, re I realized that they have, they have scientists all over the country that are working in Yellowstone and doing amazing work, but Spatially, the work wasn't always, we weren't rec recognizing the spatial aspect of the work they were doing. And so my staff created this amazing Yellowstone, online Yellowstone map, which is also on our website. And it has things from that tourists can use all the way to scientists. And um, it has a hundred layers of different data. And I've listed them here, um, the thermal features. It also has the trails, it has topography. So you could plan your hike based on what you might see. And, um, it's, and you can also download the data from this as well. So if you're wanting to pull all the thermal data, we have links to, I think my next slide. Oh. Anyway, um, our, yes, we've updated it with um, the seismic stations, the tilt meters, the stream gauges. So you can download those data as they come in live. Um, and so we released this just over a year ago. We've already had over 13,000 people viewing it and it's been really popular. So 
that's one we're, we're pretty pleased with. Um, so groundwater, uh, we're moving to groundwater now. The focus we've been taking in groundwater predominantly is salinity, groundwater salinity. And the reason we're looking at that is there are issues with injected, injecting produced water in, into basins and also using water for various industrial uses. So it'd be better if we weren't injecting into our good aquifers and if we were not using our municipal water for industrial purposes. So we've been looking at um, groundwater salinity and we did a statewide survey that I'll talk about here. And that was based on chemical analyses from the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and the USGS. We also did some more detailed basin studies based on using spontaneous potential SP well logs that look at, at salinity. And so, um, we start just for this one, the statewide one, we had 37,000 data points to start with. And we called them for various reasons and ended up with 12,000, which is still a lot of data to work with. And so we are using, um, we're using salinity and, and total dissolved solids sort of not, you know, as proxies for each other. Um, in terms of, of how water is used, for total dissolved solids, domestic usage is under 500 milligram, milligrams per liter. Industrial use is over 5,000 milligrams per liter and a very saline aquifer is over 10,000 milligrams per liter. So we, we were looking at different depths, different formations and different uh, salinity or TDS levels to try to identify areas where you could um, have water that we would never need for domestic use or agriculture or things like that. Um, so this, this map has it just a very rough estimate. The blue ones are under 10,000, the red dots are over 10,000. And then we also have an online water atlas, groundwater atlas, um, which is another interactive online map with tons of data. We bring in um, state engineer's office, the USGS, the Water Development Council, um, some DEQ, we just added some DEQ data, but basically it's again, it's an opportunity for you to go in, zoom in um, these, those uh, areas that are shown in there and the little squiggly lines on there are the hydrologic units. So they're broken out by hydrologic unit. You can zoom into where you are. You can um, pull up water quality. You can pull up wells and we just updated it so now the salinity data is in there as well. So you can go in and click on a well and it'll pull up the salinity data from those 12,000 wells that we just analyzed and see what the salinity is in your area. Um, we added the permitted springs through the state engineer's office. Um, we, had a, we did a big basin groundwater plan with, um, with the USGS and the <coughs> water development office. And so those um, aquifer maps are on there as well. And you can also just have we download these data also for it has production data on all the wells that we have access to in the state. So I think that's another really great resource for um, groundwater. So in terms of geologic mapping, that is a core component to what we do here in the state. And you would think that you know, we've been in Wyoming a while, hasn't it all been mapped? There's a one to 500,000 geologic map of the state. Yes, we have that, but um, only 47% of the state has been mapped at one to 100,000 scale. And those are the large boxes there. And in terms of surficial geology, so bedrock geology is, you know, your granite, your sandstone. Surficial geology is gravels, landslides, things like that. We have a little more mapping um, at that scale with that type of map, but bedrock geology at one to 24,000, which are the small purple boxes, those we're only at 23% for the state. And granted, we don't need that detailed of mapping for the entire state, but we need more than 23%. So we are chipping away at that. And um, they, it, is not, it is not fast going. It takes a long time to get a good map out. And, so we um, have had, we've, since 94, we've published 78, one to 100,000 scale. You can see 43, one to 24,000. We get money from the USGS to match this and we publish about three maps per year. 
is the rate we're going. So it's not gonna be done quickly, but we prioritize it based on what the state needs. Um, an example is our Rock River 1 to 100,000 scale map that I mentioned early on in the Central Laramie Range project. So this was a, a big project where we compiled 26 existing maps. It, it has a lot of different map types. It covers a large area in the, in the Laramie Range and it's been very useful for us um, in our critical minerals research. But the one that you will be interested in is the Jackson Lake 1 to 100,000 surficial geologic map. So this one is the one that's focusing on landslides, um, glacial deposits, things like that. We did the west half of this quad last year. We're gonna do the east half uh, this summer. And the LIDAR has really helped. If you look in that, the gray image there, you can see very different character in the topography. And those are different glacial deposits. So we're able to actually map out these different glacial deposits. LIDAR also helps us see the quaternary active faults much more clearly. And so that is um, an area of focus for us and we should have that map out next spring. Okay, well, one we haven't finished yet, but I wanted to give you a sneak preview is our depth to Precambrian basement. Um, this is a map, it was originally made in 91, which was a great map and a lot of people use this. This is the surface of the Precambrian basement rocks. So we projected it into the subsurface and we have the structure contours of the depth in the subsurface and where it, it um, is exposed at the surface. We've updated it because there are a lot more uh, wells that have been drilled. So we're able to project to that depth based on the well logs that we have. And, but you can see the Hannah, the Hannah Hannah Basin area, a little tricky, a lot of contour lines squished together down there um, below the granite mountains. So it's taking us some time to, to get this right, but this will be a, a nice contribution when it's finished. So for communication and outreach, uh, we do try to interact with the state and um, so we have a web page that has a lot of users um, we publish all of our maps and reports online and they're downloadable for free. If you want a printed copy, it's just the cost to, to print it and, and shipping. And um, our GIS data, so those online maps that I talked talk to you about, GIS data downloads, we have 1,200 downloads from those maps and we have a pretty healthy following on social media as well. We try to get out there in the community also. And uh, this year we visited the Wyoming State Museum. They had uh, Dino Day and 700 people showed up for Dino Day. A lot of little kids were pretty excited about the free, um, we had free Triceratops posters that uh, those were hot sellers. And uh, we had some fossil leaves that they got to take home with them. But we also, um, collaborate with teachers and also with the home, Wyoming Homeland Security to raise awareness about the great shakeout. And so being in the western part of the state, you may want to register online for the great shakeout. It's a little refresher on earthquake preparedness and the things that you might want to have on hand and the plans that you might want to make just in case. Um, the Wyoming Homeland Security, if you, if you just type in great shakeout, you'll you'll find it it's through um it's through fema yeah and then finally um we publish quite a few um things for for um communication and outreach i brought copies of our state park pamphlets we did the geology of state parks and we also recently updated our postcards so feel free to help yourself to the geologic map postcard we're pretty proud of this one. It's a much better than our old version. But that is what we're doing at the Geologic Survey. And thank you so much. Well, that's that's sort of a taste of what we're doing. We're doing a lot more, but it's all I had time for in an hour. Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, we were hit by the budget cuts. And so we're down to 18 right now. Ooh, nice. Just in case it's a first 
Okay, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, how big is the staff at the geologic survey? And we're down to 18. No, um, we have, how many admin? One, two, three, four. We have five support staff and then the rest are geologists. Yes. I have a technical question about the magnetic survey. Okay. Uh, when you apply a magnetic survey, do you just get the change in the magnetic anomaly as you go along or can you tell something about what's down there from the magnetic signature? Yeah, so magnetics, it can be a non-unique solution. So you, you because there's, it's tricky because there's the, the rock that's at the surface mm -hmm. and then there's the rock in the subsurface. And so if the rock at the surface has a strong magnetic component, it can swamp what's in the subsurface. Noise. It, yes, there, so there can be noise. Um, you can do modeling to try to try to figure out if you're looking at something shallow, something deep, the, the um, intensity of the magnetic signature. But it is, it is a non-unique solution. But what you hopefully do is if you can fly over something exposed at the surface that you can recognize with a magnetic reading and then project it based on the AeroMag data. Explain AeroMag. Um, that's flying in the air. So they fly over the ground and they have a, a hanging off the bottom of the airplane or Magnetom with the, yeah, a, mag a big Maybe. circular magnetometer did that they fly back and forth. Did you inherit that from the Navy? Um, we are hiring contractors. I don't know where they got it, <laughs> but probably, yeah. Yes. When you are going to do a mapping like in the Laramie Mountains, does your staff do that or do you uh, contract with somebody to do the mapping? The staff does. The staff does. We uh, we hire field. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was about um, do who does the geologic mapping, and so we our staff is are the the um, primary investigators. We do hire field assistants. So usually we get students right out of um, college that come and work for us for a summer and a fall perhaps, and and map and work on the and help us draft the maps. So how is the University of Wyoming doing at turning out geologists? The question is, how is the University of Wyoming doing at turning out geologists? Quite well, since I also taught there for 15 years. So, um, <laughs> and I, I ran the geology field camp. Um, I'm pretty proud of the program there. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there, I mean, of course, there's a range of students that come in, but the students that work hard and are involved and interested come out with excellent training. Yes. So the question was, um, where would we find cobalt in Wyoming? So cobalt has a potential, possibly could be associated with the coals. And so that's one of the things we're looking at. But yeah, cobalt is, if you remember that plot, it's a big red dot as far to the upper right as you can get. So that's an important one. Yeah, I was going to ask that as well. In your uh, in your process of critical minerals, are you doing some higher? Uh, is there an analysis as to what truly is economic? You may find things, but so what? You know, it's kind of like your uh, your sand bed that's old and hard, and probably not economic. But do you have some hopes for some of this uh, areas that will be economic? So the question is, are we taking economics into consideration and do we have hopes for some areas to be economic? And the answer is um, yes. So, um, you know, it's, economics are so volatile. It's, it's really hard to anticipate. Um, for instance, the, the Mountain Pass rare earth element mine in California, um, you know, China was the primary source for all of the rare earth elements. And then they, so they wrote, raised the prices and then a bunch of mines opened up and then they dropped the prices and a bunch of mines closed. And so um, it's, it's, it's difficult to know, to anticipate that. What we are doing at the survey is we are investigating everything and making a catalog of everything. And that way, when you, when you know 
when, when the economics start to be favorable, they might open that up. And the other thing is that our role is doing the, the very preliminary, get out there and look at something no one sampled before and, and then release that information and try to get it to industry who might carry that further. And part of the idea, I, my, my personal thought along those lines is that if you, if you know where these things are ahead of time, before it's a crisis, then you have careful planning and careful development rather than just a frenzied free for all trying to grab whatever you can get. So we're working on an overall catalog and trying to bring industry in to do the more extensive evaluation. Yes. Yes, that was some malachite. I'm sorry, the question was, what was the blue mineral on the rock in the picture? Yes. The big one, yes, that was trying to make my word slide more exciting, one of those, I believe. Um, yes, uh, I believe that was a malachite on some rocks in the Medicine Bow Mountains. Did I miss it? I think I know which one she means. Yeah, that was it. That was it. Yeah. No, it's it's a copper alteration. Yeah, it's a copper 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 alteration. Yes. But that is from the medicine bows. Um. Yes. So it's down in the southeast corner. So there's it's west of Laramie. Is the med are the medicine bow mountains, and this is would be south of the Cheyenne Belt, the collision zone in the Colorado province rocks. Yes, so the, so the Wyoming Craton sitting there for 2.6 billion years, you know, it, that's how old it is. Anyway, um, then the, so it's, it's sitting there until 1.7 billion years. And then the Colorado province comes in, collides along the Southern margin, and you get this, so there is some, some subduction, but mostly, con, mostly collision. And so um, if you go to the medicine bows and you look at the rocks there, the layering in these uh, metamorphosed rocks is almost vertical and oriented parallel to that Cheyenne belt. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, what was the blue mineral? And then tell me more about the Cheyenne belt and the medicine bows. And so that was my, that was my <laughs> Sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Zoom guys. So yeah, Mike, I think Mike Sure is ready to ask some questions. So you might ask Brett to put Mike Sure on. Okay, Brett, um, can you put Mike on with the questions? Yeah, hi, hi, Aaron. Uh, this this is Mike. Thank you for a very comprehensive talk about everything that the geological survey does. Uh, the first question, it seemed that the landslide potential, potential, your mapping of that, excluded Yellowstone, but included Grand Teton. And is that correct? And can you talk about that? Yes, um, we did exclude Yellowstone, um, partly because we, we can't get in there to do a bedrock map in Yellowstone. And so um, the Tetons have a better bedrock basis map. So that's, that's, where, we're, that's where we're held up there. Okay. Uh, the, <clears throat> the water maps that talk about groundwater, it seems like there's a lot of salinity in the Northeast and sort of South Central. Can you comment on that? Let's see. So part of um, part of what's tricky about evaluating this is that sometimes it's the type of wells that have been drilled. Um, so the the wells that penetrate deeper, which we see in the Powder River Basin and the Greater Green River Basin, are going to hit the saline water. This map doesn't take depth into account. Um, so we have some some maps that show different salinities at different depths. And I think it would, that would be a lot better comparison 
So it's not that there's more saline water in those two areas so much as there are more wells that were deep enough to hit the saline water in that map. Right, okay. Uh, the, the other major concern about groundwater in, in the Western US is groundwater depletion uh, as there's less water available from snow and rain than farmers are pulling groundwater out. Does the survey do any monitoring of this? Is there any concern or data on our, the, the stability of our groundwater resources? So that falls more under the state engineer's office and the Wyoming DEQ. And so those two agencies are the regulatory agencies. And so they gather those data. And what then usually happens is that we at the survey interpret those data. And we haven't, um, we do have a, a report coming out shortly on um, groundwater, I forget what the title is. It's basically looking at recharge of groundwater in the Powder River Basin as a result of the coal bed methane pumping. So we do, we do tackle a little bit. We have one hydrogeologist, so we can only do so much. Um, we would love to have more of them, but it's, that's, a, that's, an, that's an excellent point and an important, important thing to be tracking. Uh, one, one of the things that you mentioned that comes under sort of your purview are, are fossils. Uh, which, which are near and dear to my heart. So I wanted to see if you, uh, you know, what, what does the survey publish in terms of information about Wyoming fossil locations and, you know, any information about that? So unfortunately, um, when we lost positions due to the state budget cuts, um, the fossil position, we had a, someone who was part-time doing fossils and that was the one, one of the ones that we lost. So we actually, um, at this point, we are just a repository for fossils. That's our requirement is to be a repository. We have a fossil advisory board, which consists of um, some faculty and some um, museum curators, some paleontologists that are museum curators. And so when fossils come in, we defer questions to them. Unfortunately, that's all that we have the resources to do. No, no problem, just wanted to ask. Uh, I don't know if there's other questions from the audience, John. There, there are not other uh, questions that came over via the Zoom. I, I wanna thank Dr. Campbell for an excellent talk that covered an enormous state uh, and, and all the responsibilities that she has around it. I want to remind everyone that September 7th, we have an excellent talk coming up on Southern Utah, and we have two great field trips, one on Saturday that John and I are leading, if you're interested in learning more about our local geology, and then October 15th, Dr. John Geisman on uh, New Mexico geology. So from, from the Zoom portion of things, thank you very much, Aaron. It was a, a wonderful talk and you covered a lot of ground very efficiently and quickly. And, uh, and thank you for, for making the long trip out here. Thank you, Mike. I'm so glad I was able to come. I appreciate everyone's time. There's at least one more. Question. There is one more question here in the audience. Yes. I love Memorial well, the the question is, what are the what are the what gemstones is Wyoming known for? And you know, our state gemstone is jade, but it's a little hard to find. Um, you can find it out in central Wyoming most of the time. Um, it's yeah, it, there was a big there was a big jade push. It's and it you wouldn't you wouldn't recognize. You have to know what you're looking for. It looks like a little white chalky rock, and so um, inside is sometimes jade. And then, I mean, they're for non-precious things, they're garnets, but they're within other rocks. So we don't have, we have kimberlite pipes, which can generate diamonds, but we haven't actually found any, 
any economic diamonds in them. So the question was, how do you handle federal land? So um, we, get, we get permits to sample on federal land. You can get permits. So that, that can be done. Um, private land also is, land access is always an issue. And we just try to be mindful and considerate of people's wishes and the laws and still get our, our data. <laughs> okay. Do you find, um, you call that credit card voice, that's a cool, so the question is, can you take petrified wood off federal land? And I think that depends is the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. Is there? Okay, so there's a poundage. Yeah, for things other than you can't take any, um, you, you can't take any, uh, Right, so you can collect shells. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. We just want to thank uh, Dr. Campbell for coming and giving a wonderful talk. And we have a small uh, oh. thing to re help you remember us by. Thank so you. again, thanks everybody. I think Mike, Mike covered very well the upcoming self talk, so I'm not gonna repeat that. So again, thanks very much, Aaron. Um, and so again, you can tell people that uh, her talk has been recorded. And if somebody else that didn't get a chance to see it tonight wants to watch it, it will be up on our website eventually. Thank you, Eric. Thanks so much. <laughs>